everyone. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Nicole Forbes with Dennis's 7Ds and today we are talking about basic indoor plant care and selection. Um, this is, uh, naturally this is a popular topic and every time we teach it, um, it's always got a great attendance and you know those of you that have signed up today uh, so glad that you're here with us there's really uh, no more popular part of the gardening kind of world right now than indoor plants I mean maybe second would be growing food or edible uh, gardening but there are so many different people in so many different situations whether it's um, your home office dorm rooms, apartments, um, you know, new homes with bigger floor plans, lots of windows, all different reasons that people um, find that they turn to houseplants or get into houseplants. Uh, it is um, really fun for us to constantly be able to kind of um, start someone out on the path of growing plants indoors and just the, the love and the joy and and honestly, like the peace um, and and kind of you know sense of well being that you get from hanging out with plants in your house, um, I'm sure some of it has to do with like more oxygen that they create. But honestly, um, you know when it comes to cleaning your air really thoroughly, it's not scientifically proven that house plants have the ability to like really filter out our indoor air, but. Um, you know, air filters and air purifiers can do that for you. It has been scientifically proven that having more plants around you um, literally raises your serotonin levels, um, makes you happier, more productive, and in many cases that also um, helps you sleep better. Um, we find uh, higher creativity levels in spaces where there are plants and patients in hospitals tend to heal faster when they have greenery um, or access to greenery. And so we even see a lot of like therapy gardens in hospitals and, and care spaces, um, as well as, you know, again, more indoor plants and more spaces all over. Um, and I say hooray to that. <clears throat> on, the, um, on the flip side, however, is that there's not as much education and there's not as much information out there making uh, learning about growing plants indoors an easy uh, and tangible thing to do. So I, um, you know, we, we often love the opportunity, as I said, to speak to folks who are having their first experience growing plants indoors. The um, focus in a couple of a couple of weeks, we will be having another indoor plant class focused on winter houseplant care, and we're also going to cover some of the more specialty plants that we have during the holidays, like poinsettias, um, Christmas cactus, you know, amaryllis and paper whites, and those kinds of things, holiday plants. But right now, I just want to talk about plant basics. Um, and if you are, if you've recently purchased or acquired some new plants, or are considering adding plants to your house, um, the things that you would want to think about as you're, you know, going about that. So one of the, um, one of the most important, I guess, you know, things to understand as you start, as you undertake any kind of hobby and growing plants indoors would be, you know, lumped into that, any kind of hobby, um, is that there are some basic rules. Uh, some, you know, rules is a, a stiff word, but some basic practices or best practices that we acknowledge um, for the most successful growing of plants indoors. And so I want to start by going over those rules. Um, now, the information, uh, the blog, the, you know, information or handout for the class is attached to this video as a blog. And then you'll also find another piece of information that we call light reading for houseplants that's really focused more on uh, the different directions that your house windows face uh, and the type of light that's provided from those windows. And then a little bit about which kinds of plants will thrive in those environments. But um, 
if you have to use that piece and get your compass out on your phone to figure out which direction your windows face, um, that can be a game changer in really understanding um, how much light your plants are receiving or how much light your home or space has to offer, in which case you may be limited to a select group of plants. So um, let's go over these rules again. Rule number one is letting your indoor plants rest during the winter months. And um, this is a, you know, we start out with kind of a, a little bit of a controversial rule, and that is that even though these plants are indoors, they know it's winter, um, or you know, they know winter is coming. And the, the angle of the sun has gone to the south of the sky. The days are shorter, the length of the days are shorter. The, um, you know, quality of light, especially, especially here in the Pacific Northwest, is um, less uh, with more cloud cover and um, just grayer, you know, fog and haze. So the plants are aware of a change in season. Technically, tropical plants go into a dormant period, even indoors, from the months of October until February or through February. So we consider October through February the off season for these plants, and they're uh, well deserving of a rest during those months. Now, what we technically mean by rest is we try not to stimulate the plants. That includes uh, we do not fertilize, um, beginning to kind of reduce fertilization and then really no fertilizing during those winter months. The watering pattern is stepped back and so you start to uh, cut back on the amount of water that you give the plant or at least the frequency between waterings because it's growing less quickly, it's using less water from the soil. And so we want to um, adjust our watering pattern to the plant's growth. As the angle of the sun again goes lower and lower, <clears throat> we may see that our plants kind of bend and shift and change. So it's okay to rotate them or shift them or manipulate them a little bit. And if you have some leaves that are you know, yellowing or, or dead, it's okay to remove them. But I wouldn't suggest doing a lot of propagation or trying to take a lot of cuttings to be rooted or dividing your plant during this dormant period either. So again, letting them rest at this time of year. And probably the hardest thing for all of us to get into uh, understanding is Part of letting a plant rest in the winter includes not repotting or upsizing its container during this dormant season. So if you uh, find that you, uh, you know, fall in love with a plant or acquire or are gifted a plant at this time of year, you may have a, you know, fun little, of course, this is a friendship plant, uh, Pilea peperomioides the most popular gifting plant right now, or one of the most popular gifting plants. And so if you receive a plant like this in its fun little plastic container, the best thing to do would be to put it into another decorative pot, but use it as a cash pot, we call it. So really drop-in style. This container has no holes in the bottom, so this would not be a good situation to completely pot up and uh, grow in exclusively because as we water it, the water would have nowhere to go. But instead, we can take the plastic container and just set it inside the more decorative pot. Now, if it sits too low, you can always use something like a couple of stones, <clears throat> even a little like a styrofoam peanut to, to, uh, to raise up the container so that it sits a little bit higher in the pot. Um, sometimes that makes it easier to get out once you're, you know, when you try to remove it to water. I usually just kind of place my fingers inside and just, you know, grab it out. Uh, then we take the container out to water it, let it drip dry, and then we can place it back inside of its decorative pot uh, to, you know, be displayed. And this is how we suggest that you go about um, displaying your plants in general, but especially this time of year resist the urge to repot. 
that's because our plants <clears throat> that are dormant are reluctant or slower to grow into the additional soil or the new conditions that we give them. So we end up often over watering. If we repot during the dormant season, you'll see um, the plants go downhill because of root rot or over watering. So um, ideally, again, at this time of year, uh, letting your plants rest includes avoiding repotting in general. <clears throat> Now, we are about to go into the holiday season where, as I mentioned, you may be gifted plants. You may uh, pick up a couple of um, decorative, hip, you know, flowering plants that are really just kind of seasonal color. Seasonal plants, often the way that I look at them, they lasted longer than a bouquet, um, certainly longer than a bottle of wine, and they are considered to be temporary. So if the plant goes out of bloom, there's, there's, you may not have the right conditions to get the plant to go, go back into bloom, or it may be a long wait for it to uh, begin its, flat, re, you know, restart its flower cycle. So you don't owe that plant necessarily anything, and I just, you know, consider it a temporary plant. Um, Accept the loss of temporary plants. Throw out your poinsettia after Christmas. Don't try to save it from one year to the next. It's just not worth it. There's a lot better plants out there that you know deserve space on your uh, windowsill or you know whatever. So um, just that's a freeing uh, experience. Is accept the loss of temporary plants. That's rule number two. Give it extra humidity. So extra humidity, especially during the winter. You know, uh, I say anytime I notice, oh, my hands are dry, oh, I need some chapstick, <clears throat> the air is dry for me, the air is also dry for my plants. So especially in the wintertime, we uh, turn on heaters, we seal up the doors and windows, and possibly run, you know, wood stoves, fireplaces, all of these things end up drying our indoor air. And most of our tropical plants come from places that really love, have high humidity. And so they love a higher humidity or higher moisture content to the air. So extra humidity can be uh, something that requires a lot of effort or a little effort. Now, um, we often just think humidity, oh, misting, right? So um, there are some great misters out there, <clears throat> but no matter how great your actual misting bottle is, you'll need to mist the plants twice a day to really increase the humidity enough to make a difference for them, at least twice a day. Now, if you're misting a plant twice a day and it's in your home, that usually means you're also misting maybe your books, your bookcase, your furniture, your dining room table. Um, some of these furniture items don't appreciate being misted twice a day. So that ends up with a lot of kind of incidental um, overspray that can be hard to avoid. So I'm not a big fan of misting, but you can use a simple humidifier. Um, so, you know, really dry home. Uh, some folks with, you know, um, nasal congestion or uh, various, you know, uh, skin or health issues can certainly benefit from uh, an increased moisture in the air. So running a humidifier in your dry air homes in the winter can be beneficial. And at the same time, that humidifier uh, will certainly benefit several of your indoor plants as well. An easy way to increase humidity around indoor plants is what we call a pebble tray or basically just like a humidity tray. A pebble tray is like passive, uh, passive humidity. And uh, an example of that, I don't have a total example, but an example would be to use just a regular plastic saucer um, or even like a, you know, like a cafeteria tray, uh, um, any kind of, you know, tray that's maybe a half, three quarters of an inch to an inch deep. And then fill it with a layer of pebbles. I have, for example, just some uh, mid-sized pebbles. These are like peanut M&M size. Um, so, you know, decent sized pebbles. And the pebbles would go over the tray and then my plants would sit on top of the pebbles. <clears throat> then I would add water to the tray and the water would, would sit right to the bottom of those pebbles. I don't want my plant to sit in water 
but I want the water level to be just low enough that as the water passively evaporates throughout the day in my home, the humidity is increased around the kind of immediate space above that tray where the plants sit. So a humidity tray could be um, full of pebbles here, fill it with water just to the bottom, add plants such as a maidenhair fern that loves high humidity. This is a plant that um, in regular conditions in my home often goes dry before I have a chance to water it again. Um, and by adding a humidity tray to its growing conditions, it seems to stabilize its moisture needs and it's able to then, you know, pull more moisture out of the air and make it longer between my waterings um, so that it's not uh, tending to go dry so much in between waterings and struggle. So humidity trays can make a big difference in uh, calatheas, in uh, ferns, a lot of maidenhair ferns especially, um, but I wouldn't use a humidity tray around succulents um, or cacti or something like that. So, you know, we're not going to miss the leaves of those plants. We're not going to raise humidity um, on those plants. Um, so again, just kind of understanding um, the nature of your plants is also an important factor. Treat problems promptly. That's rule number four. Now, treating problems promptly um, is like you know what, that's just a good guideline for everything, right? Every, every step in life, every part of life, our health, um, you know, the way that we should approach the world, treat problems promptly. Everything snowballs and gets out of control. If only I'd uh, acted sooner. If only I'd uh, checked for this or that. So we want to get to know our house plants and um, like hang out with them, engage with them. Um, even as we go into the winter, I mean, it, it's like having pets, right? Um, what, what point is it to have pets if you never like play with them or hang out with them or have fun with them or let them sit on your lap? Well, they, you're not gonna walk your house plants and they're, they could sit on your lap, but that's probably not you know, what's gonna happen. You're going to admire and appreciate that. You might share on Instagram when a new leaf unfurls and you're super excited or you know whatever there's there are groups of plant appreciation um, you know far and wide and your people are waiting to share you know how wonderful it is to have plants indoors so examining your plants on a regular basis um, a weekly at least you know checking of uh, health and conditions is going to catch a pest problem a watering issue um, before it go, gets out of control and then you've got a real problem on your hands. So treating problems promptly. And if you don't, if you've identified something must be wrong, but you're not sure what is happening, that's when you turn to experts such as um, the folks here at Dentist's Seven Ds. Uh, there's always a way to contact us through our uh, website or email or you know call a store directly. Uh, we'll have, you know, you bring us pictures or samples or in some cases the plant itself and we'll figure out what's wrong and walk you through some treatment problem, uh, treatment processes. So um, we're here for you. We just need you to uh, be able to identify that problem and the sooner the better. So learn to repot when needed. That is, um, again, A, we're not going to repot right now because it's winter. B, it's pretty rare, unless you're like rescuing plants from estate sales or something, Beth and Molly, I know you, uh, unless you're doing that, you know, or getting plants from somebody who's moving across state um, or, you know, something, and they're abandoning plants and you're getting old plants. If you're getting new plants, it's not very common that they immediately need to be repotted. So I'm going to say that again. New plants rarely need to be immediately repotted. So learning to repot when necessary, first off, is giving your plants some time and space. Um, when you bring them home, they're already adjusting to some new conditions. Different light than maybe where they grew up. Different air than maybe where they grew up. Different tap water different minerals in their water, 
uh, and you, of course, a different caretaker. So if we add to those factors that we have a hard time, you know, controlling, we're going to take them home and they need to either like the light and like me and like my water, uh, but we can limit some of the changes that our plants immediately experience so that when something maybe is disagreeable to the plant, we can hone in on what it was or what they had disagreed to. So at least waiting six weeks before you change the soil or repot a plant will help you establish whether or not when that does occur, when you repot, when you change soil, if that is something that the plant objects to or responds to as opposed to the new light, the new air, the new water, the new you, um, all of that. So <coughs> when you repot, in most cases, <coughs> you want to go only up in size by two to three inches. So um, in most cases, we have kind of a standardized container size, four inch, six inch, then we go to eight inch, um, you guessed it. So, you know, as we go up in size, that's the natural shift of what you would go up to. We wouldn't necessarily put a four inch plant directly into an eight inch container. Uh, in, instead, we would go four inch to six inch to eight inch, and that would be over maybe 18 months or two years or even longer. <clears throat> Young plants, immature, you know, we got a young plant. These are young, immature plants versus a more mature plant like this large Sansevieria. Young plants, in most cases, are faster growing than older, more mature plants. So if you have a young Monstera, a young fiddle leaf fig, you may be upsizing the container about every 18 months, year and a half. As the plant gets older and older and slows its growth, at that point, you may be able to go two to three years between repotting into the next size container. <coughs> Excuse me. Most plants prefer a slightly tight growing condition or tight pot. Most indoor plants prefer to be slightly root bound, um, especially prefer slightly root bound to like having ample uh, soil conditions. Now, one of the few plants that can take a big container and pretty much immediately fill it or um, thrive in it would be the Monstera deliciosa. So the Monstera um, grows kind of like a goldfish, you know, um, the bigger the pot, the bigger it'll get in response to it. Um, so you can go ahead and, and do that. But again, not necessarily at this time of year. Don't drown them. Water on a schedule and with seasonal variation. Okay, so, uh, and then the last question, or last rule is choose wisely. So watering, watering is usually the most often asked question that we get. How do I water this? How often do I water this? And it would be great if we had, you know, like a number system or, um, some sort of just like rule, you know, um, snake plants should be watered every 28 days. There, but there's no rule like that. And the reason there's no rule is that plants use of water is affected by a ton of different factors. A, how much light they have. B, what time of year it is. C, what kind of pot they're in. What size, what kind of soil they have and more than that, but that's, those are some basics. So, <coughs> excuse me, the brighter light, same plant and brighter light will use more water than the same plant in a lower light condition. And Sansevieria is a good example of that, excuse me. So although our friendly snake plant is tolerant of low light conditions, it is also able to grow in brighter light but in brighter light, that plant will need to be watered slightly more often than the plant in lower light. Now, when we suggest the drop-in style of 
display, the cash pot uh, container style or container growing style. One plastic pot dropped into a more decorative pot. Not only is that because there's no drain hole in a lot of these containers, but the plastic container that the plant comes in uh, weighs next to nothing. So the pot itself is very lightweight. When we have it in that lightweight pot, <clears throat> the way that we decide when or how much water the plant needs is all based off of the weight of the container. So the weight of the plant itself a heavy plant is full of water in the soil, and a lightweight plant is usually uh, has lost water from the soil, and so then it's lighter weight. So when we don't have space or don't want to stick our finger in or use a moisture probe, we can simply get used to the, the feel of the plant to determine whether or not it needs water. So of course, I would do two things pick it up and feel how heavy it is, and then look at the color of the soil to tell me whether or not it's light in color or it's dark in color. Sometimes I'll also look at the color of the soil through the holes in the pot bottom of the container, <clears throat> but this snake plant feels relatively light, but not super light. It's actually a little bit top heavy because it's a chunky little thing here, uh, but Soil is light in color, it's relatively lightweight. So right now, because it's easy to do, we can also just take it out of the container and look and see. So although the first inch or so is actually light in color, we can see a darkening of color in the soil to the bottom and actually fairly moist soil still towards the bottom of the pot. So I'm going to go ahead and give this still a couple days before it's checked again and possibly watered then. But, I, but realizing that we are in the dormant season, that it is uh, getting darker, that this plant is slowing its growth, it is better to err on the side of allowing it to go a little drier than watering it just in case. Um, so watering just in case can lead to all kinds of problems. So using that weight of the pot to, uh, to kind of determine whether or not it needs watering is um, really the best practice. And often when we water, especially once you've allowed a plant to get relatively dry, you can fill a saucer, a tray, even like a you know Rubbermaid or top, Tupperware bin with an inch or two inches of water and then actually set your plant, pretend there's water in here, right? set your plant in the water and give it 15, 20 minutes or so. It will begin to absorb water from the holes on the underside of the pot. And now after a 15, 20 minutes in the water basin, if you lift it up, you'll also want to take notice of the fact that it has gained weight as well. So when a plant gets really dry, sometimes the soil pulls away from the sides of the container and makes it really hard to re-wet. And when she, you know you water with the water can, it just kind of like rolls off the crusty top and just like goes out the drain holes in the bottom and your plant didn't get any of the water. So when you bottom water, that can not only um, keep the foliage dry, which in certain plants that they prefer to keep the leaves dry, but that can help pull water up in dry, hard, crusty soil so that again, you can make sure by weight that it has gained weight and um, gotten hydrated. Another way to deal with kind of dry, crusty soil <clears throat> is to use a pencil or a chopstick and push vertical holes through, gently push vertical holes through the soil uh, from the top to the bottom to just kind of aerate gently and that allows air and water to more easily penetrate that old kind of crusty soil. And that will get you through, you know, if you've got some, some crummy soil conditions or borderline soil conditions, and you really think, gosh, I just want to repot, some of those tricks will get you through until March when it's much safer uh, and more practical to repot uh, for the plants, for the plant's sake. Now, <coughs> I have a tickle in my throat. <clears> throat> the last 
rule or pro tip is choose wisely. And really this is, you know, this is the, the nitty gritty of it, right? So although we are often asking about how much water, how much water, how much water does my plant get, uh, we, we always start with, well, what kind of light is the uh, area going to receive or how much light will this plant be in? Now attached to this blog, or attached to this video, is a graphic piece that um, we've created that is, as I mentioned, focused on the window direction. Uh, is there a glare or anything that's going to work? Yeah. So anyways, look on the attachment. Um, I'm just showing you from afar. Uh, this is a graphic representation of the different directions that your windows face. And by the different direction, how far from the windows and light source do you get bright light, medium light, or low light? Understanding the limitations of the light in your home, as I mentioned, can greatly impact uh, the success you have because it may just simply limit a group of plants that don't do well in your home. I will use my house as a perfect example. Most of my windows are on the north side of my house. North exposure windows, if you look at our uh, little graphic, don't actually produce or provide bright light whatsoever. Right in the window, we can get some medium bright light in a north exposure, but I simply cannot grow bright light plants um, in my home without the assistance of full spectrum um, light enhancements or plant lights. So uh, I do have some of those as you can imagine, but um, understanding that means that I'm not likely to try to take home something like a fiddle leaf fig that requires not only an, a little bit of a more skilled hand, um, but bright light conditions, and I simply can't provide that. So I acknowledge that and I have plants that thrive in medium light and low light. So understanding the amount of light that you get is primary to uh, making right choices. And really, the wide range of plants available at this point in time um, can, can really kind of uh, blow your mind. I mean, again, We've got uh, some real specialty items. So I, I was showing as my watering example, this is a Birkin philodendron, uh, which is definitely one of the kind of hot collector's plants right now. Uh, she's a lovely little lady that um, is in a six inch container, gorgeous variegation, a brand new leaf coming out right now that you know is Instagram worthy for sure. But the range of styles and shapes and colors even of plants. Uh, there's almost something you know to suit every condition. So again, choosing and, and talking to experts at the places that you are shopping, uh, if you don't feel comfortable about making some selections, uh, it can really, again, make a difference. We're gonna try to steer you towards a plant that you're gonna be successful with um, and especially if you're a beginner, that's going to be some of our like trusty, easy care, uh, hard to kill in any kind of light condition type plants. And so first off you will see, um, again, four plants for low light, four plants for bright light, <clears throat> and then a hard to kill plants on the back of the handout. And hard to kill plants are some of my favorite to show off. Um, they are also some of the most attractive and kind of modern or architectural looking. So this is a ZZ plant. This is an extremely uh, slow growing, but easy care plant for goes in low light. It'll also take relatively high or bright medium light and low water usage. So um, not only does the ZZ plant have kind of a water storage apparatus in its root system, but it also has these kind of cool, thick, fleshy stems that store water in their fleshy stems. And then you can see like a sheen on their leaves. 
So they have like a waxy coating on their leaves that also helps to hold moisture in to that leaf surface. So ZZ is its um, shortened name because its botanical name is Zamio cuculus zamiofolia. Uh, so it's ZZ is, you know, an easy way to uh, call it. And I always just remember it, ZZs are easy, you know, so that's kind of a um, fun way to remember things. And, or, you know, dumb, I don't know. You can start with a great big ZZ, or you can start with the tiny ZZ. So a little 14, uh, excuse me, four inch guy here, or we had a eight inch, 10 inch? 10 inch ZZ there. So ZZs and another excellent plant, low light, low moisture, like neglectable. These plants are neglectable. Great office plants, for example, is a snake plant. Now snake plant here comes again in a ton of different kind of leaf patterns and some different leaf styles. So I was showing this little chubby short variety versus kind of your more standard Sansevieria Laurentii here is the taller with the yellow stripes. There's also black coral back here in the background, stunning dark green with lighter green uh, kind of horizontal striping. And one of my favorites here, which is fernwood. So you can see fernwood has just tiny, thinner, uh, a little bit more relaxed or cur outward curving leaves instead of such a straight up and down uh, profile. <clears throat> Sansevieria and ZZ plants, although they are top of the list for low maintenance, neglectable, easy plants, they are both um, toxic to pets. So best to have, uh, and the children, you know, so best to have kind of high up or uh, out of reach of a pet if you have any that might be tempted to chomp on them. Um, <clears throat> also, in the background here, we see a lovely philodendron, um, excuse me, a, pa a pothos and another little baby pothos, which um, are also super beginner plants. I mean, these are some of the most common that we have as uh, hanging baskets or uh, are given by friends from uh, little pieces that can be snipped off and rooted in water. So you can see here, dangling off of the edge of the stem, there's a little root that's already kind of uh, waiting to, it's kind of dried up, this root's dried up, so it's not gonna do much, but there are little bumps further along the stem that are waiting to become roots. So if we snipped this and placed it in water, all of these roots would start to grow and eventually we would have a plant that could be uh, potted up and, and given away or added to our jungle. <clears throat> Those same roots along the stem on this totem, get it closer to the camera, so this shows us the habit of the pothos, and we'll also see the same habit on philodendrons and uh, several other members of the aeroid family, is the tendency to look for structural support in the jungle in their native habitat. They would find a tree, and up the trunk of the tree, this floppy, kind of viney plant that doesn't have trunks and wood and uh, enough sturdiness to grow tall on its own will actually attach roots. I don't know if you can see, here's a larger root that's grown down and is actually uh, kind of hugging the stem or hugging this piece of wood. But here you can see all these little brown, you see them at all? Yeah. So these little brown kind of, uh, looks like caterpillar legs or, you know, little feet that come out of the plant. Those are grabbing onto the wood itself and attaching it firmly to the stake. And if we see even up at the very top here, this nice white portion of the bottom shows some brown bumps. Those brown bumps are about to turn into more of these little roots to grab onto the post, but of course there's no more post to climb onto, so this plant would need a larger post to continue climbing. 
but those are aerial roots that can, again, get uh, support for the plant to grow tall instead of trailing over. And often when they begin growing up a pole or a support like this, the leaves can also increase in size. So now we've seen this pothos leaf get twice as big as it would if it were on a hanging basket or you know in a little container. So um, fun to just see the kind of dramatic changes that plants go through when <clears throat> their con like the more natural conditions are uh, replicated. Now, another extremely hard to kill plant for low light is sometimes a little hard to come by, um, but I just love this plant. This is a cast iron plant. Uh, now cast iron plant has this, again, kind of lush, deep green leaf that collects a lot of dust. So anything with this kind of nice big leaf needs to be kept clean. And especially as we're running, again, the heater's in the house, dust is going everywhere. So on a weekly basis, uh, this is a great plant to just kind of dust off or wipe clean all the leaves. Um, and I'll tell you a little secret. So I go around, I have a lot of houseplants, um, and so that was not the secret. I go around with my uh, bathrobe, and it's like a, you know, fuzzy terry cloth bathrobe. And the, you know, tie of the bathrobe, the tie itself makes a really great plant leaf wiper offer. Um, it's like thin and gentle and um, with me because I do all my plant care in my pajamas um, as part of my, you know, like extended morning of meditation and serenity. Um, so the little sash of my bathrobe uh, is just perfect for, again, wiping off and, and dusting off leaves. Now that means it's always kind of dirty. Um, the secret is I have two little ties around my waist and one is like the plant dusting sash and the other one is my actual sash for my bathrobe. So um, if you have an extra bathrobe tie or sash and it's soft and terry clothy um, or fuzzy, it makes it a fabulous plant wipe. It's, you know, there's lots of it. You can always just kind of roll up the dirty part and keep going and then throw it in the wash. Um, Socks are another good one, but honestly, socks are, sometimes they're not soft enough. Um, so, and socks, I don't know, I'd rather use my bathroom. So anyways, there's the, uh, that's me and my plants, because we hang out together on Sunday mornings and just, you know, have quiet time in our jammies. Now, um, speaking of, again, some, you know, plants that we have different relationships with, another low light easy care plant this is called a Chinese evergreen um, I love to think about Chinese evergreen as um, almost always the plant that hangs out with me waiting for the dentist or the doctor this is a like waiting room plant that that's because it grows also again in like low light conditions it's easy care it's quite reactive so when it's thirsty it will tell you with a little bit of a droop and then it can be watered and perks right back up so it's quite sturdy as well um, and uh, really attractive I mean again just something kind of calming and peaceful about the um, foliage on this plant which is kind of a nice soft variegation Aglionema is the botanical name Chinese evergreens come in a lot of different again color patterns and leaf patterns um, and are best in low or even medium light and then the next The next level of care, but still a, a gorgeous foliage, are calatheas. And I show off the different leaves of calatheas again just to see all of the things, all of the leaf colors and patterns that you can get from the indoor plants without necessarily a flower um, involved. So foliage um, alone, orbifolia here, gorgeous foliage. Foliage alone can be really exciting and give you lots of um, attraction and color in the house. But again, knowing your limits and knowing the plants that work for you is the most important thing. I have had 
plants and spaces that are not ideal. Um, my fireplace mantle is one. The uh, upstairs guest bedroom is another one. You know, the blinds are always closed. I'm not in there very often, those kinds of things. If you want to have a plant in a space where there is simply not enough light um, or conditions are not ideal for them, I suggest having two of the same plant. Um, so two identical snake plants in four inch pots, two identical ZZs, um, two identical bird's nest ferns, whatever it is, at least, you know, be realistic and start with a pretty neglectable or low light plant in the first place. But then about every week to 10 days, as you're kind of, you know, checking in on the plant, doing your little morning dusting and hanging out, you're going to switch the two plants. So one sits in the space that is not ideal for it. The other one sits in maybe a place that has either a plant light or a brighter environment um, that can help it kind of recuperate from the week that it was in the not so great environment. So um, switching out plant A and plant B uh, every time you water or every time you, you know, dust can keep one plant looking good um, in its happy spot and then it doesn't go downhill fast enough in its unhappy spot before you switch them back out again. And that can be kind of a, again, you know, a sneaky but easy way to have plants in places that maybe they, they wouldn't normally be happy in. The, uh, again, you'll see on the handout plants for uh, more advanced care. Now I did uh, allude to the fiddle leaf fig or ficus. Um, you will see plants both, uh, you know, promoted as collector plants or in magazines or things that, you know, maybe make you think, well, everybody's growing this. Um, the temptation is high uh, to attempt to grow something such as a fiddle leaf, but if you don't have the right environment for it, the bright enough conditions, um, you're going to struggle with it. I love maidenhair ferns, as I mentioned before, <clears throat> and I have struggled with a maidenhair at home just like this. And um, so realizing for me, my air was dry. This was the plant that seemed to want more humidity than almost any other plant in my uh, collection, at least in this space. And so providing this plant with a humidity tray has made all of the difference in just that uh, enhanced moisture in the air around it. I brought um, into the classroom today, so a happy, healthy looking maidenhair fern here. And although this one got watered <clears throat> this morning, I think that, can you see a difference? Yeah, so this one, if you look a little bit, maybe closer, the foliage is a little shriveled. The angle of the branches is way droopier. So we have a perkier, more upright fern here in the bright, bright green pot, well hydrated, even kind of heavy when I feel her. <clears throat> and now not only uh, do we see that kind of slightly droopy angle of the branches, but once you also look at the inside, you'll be able to see, A, it's in a smaller pot. <clears throat> so, doesn't hold as much moisture, same size plant, but in a smaller container. And now you can really see here in the lower portions where it's really dry and even kind of crispy, feels crispy to the touch. Now the really damaged and dry leaves that are losing color and are crispy, we'll just have to prune those off, trim those off. <clears throat> but some of the upper uh, foliage, hopefully we caught it and watered it before it got too damaged. Um, and it will mostly recuperate, but this is a, you know, this is, there's a learning curve when you grow plants. So it's easier to let them go a little dry and then, uh, trim off the dry pieces and try harder to water better next time than to constantly water and give a plant sips and sips and keep it wet all the time. So keeping a plant wet all the time tends to lead to root rot and root rot is almost a, a sure death spiral for most plants. So really hard to pull out of um, a root rot scenario. Um, but plants are natural 
and are always going to have little bits that need to be trimmed off. So here again, we've got a gorgeous golden pothos. It's healthy, it's happy, it's living large, but if you look inside, way in here, there's a leaf that's yellow, and even with just a little bit of pressure, it comes right off and detaches. So although I've got brand new growth, new leaves come in, this guy's growing in almost all directions. One little yellow leaf deep inside the plant should not concern me. So it's not going to send me to the internet, um, to the plant store, you know, to all my books to try to figure out why this one leaf turned yellow. I, of course, noticed it early on because I'm treating and catching problems promptly and hanging out with my plants on a weekly basis. So I'm going to look and see, okay, here's another. This one was really dry inside. I probably missed that last week. Otherwise, soil looks good, plant looks good, new growth looks healthy. It's just like when I brush my hair, I get some hair that comes off in the brush. Or uh, our skin cells are constantly dying and replacing themselves. This is, again, a natural organism that is growing new leaves and occasionally ditching the old ones. So um, in nature, this would probably drop off on its own or whatever, and we just have to give it a hand sometimes. <clears throat> now, uh, you know, excessive yellowing, excessive leaf loss is um, something to be concerned about. And most of the older or discolored leaves that you'll remove should usually be either like inside the plant or low down on the plant and not um, you know, brand new um, or, or recently produced leaves or foliage. Um, so the pattern of where the leaves are lost or, or are showing damage is also important. Don't worry about this, go ahead and compost it. Uh, the rest of your plant looks great and, you know, again, it's a natural organism. So um, there's so much to talk about and we've got an amazing inventory of indoor plants right now. All of the Dennis Assembly's locations have just um, received a shipment of some larger plant inventory, so our tropical selection is pretty good at the moment. And um, we are always eager to help you select the right plant for the right place um, with just a few questions asked, and you'll go home happy and successful. So as always, thanks for watching. Uh, any questions that are um, typed in there, I will answer after the video ends. and. Uh, Happy gardening.